Welcome to this course called uh, Data Visualization with R Studio and GDPlot Intermediate. This is a follow-up on our introduction. Uh, you might have followed that at UQ or online. And we're going to have a closer look at the GGplot2 package today. And specifically, um, we're going to have a look at installing a custom tool or a tool for picking colors rather to customize scales and ranges. We'll divide a visualization in several facets. We'll explore new geometries, modify statistical transformations, adjust a geometry's position, and um, have a closer look at themes too. I might also introduce an extra add-in to our studio that can uh, be, facilitate your life um, or your work with ggplot2. So hopefully you find this session um, enjoyable and useful and yeah we'll get started with opening our studio so you should have R and R studio already installed on your computer I've got the latest version of R studio R studio 1.2 and the version of R that I am currently using is version 3.6.0 which is also the latest uh, at the time of recording this video so having up-to-date software and packages is always a good idea. Uh, I mean, often a good idea, uh, unless you really want to stick to particular package versions that are important for your work. So we've got on the left here our console panel. You can see our prompt here waiting for input. There's some information about, as I said, our R version, some recommended functions here. So what else can we see in our studio? We've got our environment at the top right, and we've got our files pane here that show us our home directory files and a few more uh, useful tabs here that we'll go through as we need. So we'll have to make sure that we've got ggplot2 installed on our computer before we can keep going. So what you can do is use the function install.packages and as an argument give the string of characters ggplot2. Now once you execute this it should fairly quickly install the necessary packages. If you already have the package on your computer it will update to the latest version and once you're back at your prompt and there's no error message, you should be good to go. You can double check in your packages pane, so you can find this panel, this pane, this tab here in the bottom right of our studio, and you'll find that ggplot2 here shows up. And it's described as create elegant data visualizations using the grammar of graphics. The version is 3.1.1, that's the one we're going to use today. The other bit of setting up that we'll do is creating a new project. So we're going to go to the second button in the toolbar here, the second icon. You can click on that and select Create Project New Directory. So we don't have a directory to start with. And New Project. So basic new project. I save all my directories or all my projects inside an R projects directory. And I'm going to name this one ggplot2 underscore intermediate. So this is the name of your project and which is the same of as your working directory and this is where it's going to be saved going to click create project. So it restarts our session. We still have our package installed because you only need to do that once. It stays on your computer. What we'll need to do is load the package later on to access the functions inside ggplot2. As you can see if you scroll through your packages, there's a few packages that are already loaded automatically when a new session is started. So for example you can see graphics here and graphic devices. Those are ticked, so they're loaded automatically and their functions are available. There's quite a few in there that are part of BASAR and that are usually needed for your work. So we've got our project. 
everything that we'll do now will happen in by default inside this directory ggplot2 underscore intermediate and the only file that we can see currently is the rproj file our project file that you can reopen later on to go back to your work and to our studio one more thing that we can do to keep things tidy is to use the dear.create function to create a new folder and we're going to call this one plots so we can store all our plots in there dear.create plots it's a string of characters as an argument once you press enter and execute the command you can see the new directory here in your files pane and finally still setting up a little bit we'll be using a script today so you can use the first button in the toolbar here or first icon and use the first choice in this drop down menu for a new R script you can also use the control shift N shortcut if you need to or if you want to do that more quickly and we've got a new panel opening it's the source panel or source pane and you can start typing your code in there so I'll start with a couple of comments they start with a hash symbol and we'll say this is first a description intermediate session on ggplot2 little typo here an author that's my name and a date is today's date which is the 7th of May 2019 in this session we're going to play around with a data set called Gapminder it's a smaller version of the data that's provided by the Gapminder project and um, we're going to import that in a minute okay so I'll add a comment import data and we'll put our command here to import the data and execute it from the script before we keep going notice that our script is called untitled1 and there's an asterisk next to the name this means we haven't saved it we can click the floppy disk icon here or we can use Control S like in most applications, most programs, to save our script. So I'll click on that. By default, it saves it in the working directory, so the project directory. And I'm going to give it the name process. I can click save or press enter. And now we've got a process.capital R file in our working directory. You can see the name at the top of our source pane you can see it in our files tab too it added automatically dot capital R because this is the default extension for an R script and it'll make clear to your system that this file this text file simple text file contain our source code All right so to import the data we're going to use the command that starts with the name of the object we want to save the data in so gapminder and use the assignment operator to store something inside it so I'll use the base function read.csv and as an argument I only need one thing where the file is located and this can be locally on your computer but it can also be a URL so you can find the URL in the description of this video but I'm going to copy it from the course notes which are also linked in Oh, under the video in the description of the video so I'll copy this URL here here we go it's a rather long one so I'd rather not type it and in between double quotes we've got this string of characters that shows that tells read.csv where the file is located I can now press control enter if you've got your cursor anywhere in the command or at the end of the line you can use control enter it's the same as pressing this button here run you can see that it tells us control plus enter is a shortcut to use it and this sends the command to our console and executes it so it's worked we've got a new object here gapminder and we can see the size of 
the data set. I'm just going to make sure, make a note of this shortcut to execute from script. So our data is called Gapminder. It's got 1704 observations and six variables. And if you click on this blue arrow here, you can see the different variables that are contained in it. So those are your different columns in your data frame. Country, year, population, continent, life expectancy, and GDP per capita. You can also see how the data was imported or interpreted. There's a factor, an integer, and some numerical data or another factor here. So depending on the data that it has found, and it has done apparently the good thing, uh, it has assigned a type to the data. So if you want to familiarize yourself with the data, you can use a couple of commands like summary, which will give you summary statistics for the data set. Execute that and you'll see in your console for each one of those six variables some summary statistics which change depending on the type of the data. So now we know that the data set starts in 1952 and finishes in 2007. We can also see that for each country there are 12 observations, so 12 years. And we can also see the maximum life expectancy and maximum here and minimum life expectancy ever recorded. Now another way to explore your data is to use the view function. If you simply want to have a look at a tabular data view, it's, uh, it opens a new tab titled Capminder and you can scroll through or search for a term and this is more similar to any spreadsheet program that you might be used to using. So this might be a better way to explore your data. So make sure you use view with the capital V here because R recognizes or R makes the difference between capitals and lowercase. The case of your functions and objects, etc., will matter. So we have a bit of an idea of what the data is. Now let's start exploring it visually. So previously in the introduction to ggplot2, we've gotten used to the usual syntax of a ggplot2 visualization. So we're going to keep using that full syntax and using those three essential elements. So I'll go through them once more and then we'll uh, experiment a bit more with ggplot2. So let's make sure we load the package. You can do that with the library function and we need to load library, uh, sorry, ggplot2. Execute that, and if you check in your packages pane, you'll see that ggplot2 is now ticked. Now let's let's visualize our dataset, and what we're going to have a look at in our first visualization is the growth in population over the years. So we can do that with Starting with the ggplot function, make sure it's ggplot, not ggplot2, where we can set a few defaults. And we're going to use our three essential elements today. So the first, where the data comes from, that's gapminder, our data set. Second argument after a comma is mapping, which will take the function AES for aesthetics. And we'll decide to associate the aesthetic x with the variable year. We'll also use the aesthetic y or the y-axis and associate it to population pop. Make sure you close the two parentheses and after that we'll add a plus to make sure we let gplot2 know that the command is not finished and add our third essential element which is the geometry and in this case we use the geom underscore point function to use the point geometry. So we've got our data, where the data comes from, 
we've got the mapping of aesthetic elements to variables from our data set and we've got a way to visualize the data, a geometry. So I can execute this and I can visualize the growth in population for this particular data set. So going from 1952 to 2007, we've got two countries that dominate the data set here, and that's going to be China and India at the top. And everyone else bunched up at the bottom. So we always remember to have those three essential elements, data, mapping of aesthetics, and geometry. So remember that we can add an extra aesthetic element in our aesthetic call, AES, and for example we can color our points according to another variable. So in our case we're going to use the continent variable, which is a factor, a categorical variable, and we want to identify where those points come from. So we're going to go color equals continent. Execute that again. And with this extra line, extra argument, we can now have some color on our points and see where in which continent each point is from. So there's quite a few different aesthetic uh, aesthetics that you can use in your visualizations. Some of them work with some geometries, others won't. So depending on the geometry that you use, some aesthetic elements will make sense or not. So we've used color, we've used fill in the previous session. Uh, there's others like shape and size that you can use. You can experiment with those too. So let's have a little bit more control over colors. This is the default palette that ggplot2 uses. There's going to be one for discrete values, there's going to be, uh, or for categorical variables, there's going to be one uh, blue scale, color scale that's used, or color gradient that's used for continuous variables. But let's have a look at if we want to change those defaults or replace those defaults. Let's have a look at the help page for a function called scale underscore color underscore brewer. We don't need those parentheses at the end, we only need the name of the function. And this is a function that's part of the package ggplot2, you can see it here. It's described as sequential diverging and qualitative color scales from colorbrewer.org. So when you see this color brewer, you know that those palettes have been sourced from the project color brewer. So those palettes are straight away available in ggplot2 when you've loaded the package and you can see the names of the different palettes when you get to the palettes section. So there's going to be some diverging ones some quali qualitative ones, sorry, and some sequential ones. If you want to visualize those ones, you can go to the website colorbrewer2.org and as you can see it was originally created to categorize or to color spatial data. You can see those different palettes, click on those ones, and see the name here. So Pubu, for example, that's from purple to blue, I believe. You can uh, have a look at the different sequential ones, but if you want to change that to diverging, you can click on this one here, diverging, explore those ones, find the one that you like, and finally qualitative is up here and change those ones too. So here we're looking at qualitative data, our continents. So for example, we could change 
our palette to something different. Let's say we want to try this particular one, set one. So I'm going to go to our code and add an extra plus sign here to add an extra function afterwards, a modifier of the scale. So I'm going to go scale underscore color underscore brewer and set the palette to set one. So you can see that our colors changed. Now it's using this particular color brewer palette called set one. I made sure that I selected one that was qualitative and it's worked. Now if you want to display the palettes and select, choose your palettes more comfortably inside our studio, you can use the following functions to visualize them. So to visualize Color Brewer Palettes, we can load the package R Color Brewer. Now notice that this is the American spelling here. R Color Brewer, there's no U, and there's a capital R, capital C, and capital B. Execute that. We've got the package loaded and we can use the function display.brewer.all. And this function will display in the plots window or plots panel the different palettes that are available. So I'll execute this line, line 29. And there's all our palettes. So that might be a more comfortable way to find the palette that you want to use. And I particularly like this function because you can slightly modifi modify it by adding an extra argument, colorblind friendly. You can see it's suggested here in the drop down. So that's a capital F. Colorblind friendly and set it to equal to true. By default it's set to false. So make sure you set it to true here. And this will reduce the choices, although there's still quite a bit of choice there. There's three um, qualitative ones. So for example, if you really want to make sure your your visualization is accessible to all, you can set your color palette to set two, which is a colorblind friendly palette. You can see it here listed. And that will make sure that it's accessible to most people. Right, so this is the built-in palette that we can use straight away with ggplot2. Now we'll follow on with saving ourselves some typing because we'll keep modifying this plot. And we're going to create an object called P that takes this base plot. So we had first in the ggplot call where the data comes from. And let's type this one to practice. Data equals getminder. Mapping equals the AES function that contains x equals year, y equals pop, and color equals continent. And the geometry that we use is the point geometry. So this is the base of our plot. If you execute this, there won't be anything in the plot window, but I can show you my environment here and you'll see that there's a new object called P that is a list. And that's the base of our plot that we can reuse afterwards. So for example, let's try to create a custom palette. So instead of using the built-in palette, or one of the several built-in ones, I'm going to use our base plot here so we don't have to type it again, p, add a plus afterwards, and then use the function called scale color 
underscore manual instead of brewer. Scale underscore color underscore manual. And we have to provide it with values. So R contains a bunch of colors, several hundred, hundreds, a um, bunch of colors with particular names. So you can expect blue to exist, red, purple, green, and orange. So I've got five colors because I've got five continents here in my data set. I'll execute that and you can now see our updated plot using our custom palette. If you need to find out about the color names in R, you can use the function color without any argument and this will print out, oh, sorry, colors plural. And this will print out the list of 657 color names. So it's not particularly comfortable to pick a color from, although you can search for particular terms in there. So there is a more comfortable way to do things, and that's using an add-in. That's called color picker. So some packages that you install, let's try this. Install that packages in the console. Color picker, all lowercase with the British slash Australian spelling here, color picker. If you execute this and install this add-in, instead of being a package that you load and you use the functions of, you'll see that it, it will add an extra element in your menu in our studio. So there's an add-ins drop down here. You can click on that and pick the color picker tool. It says that it lets you easily select colors and that's particularly useful to find the colors that you need. So instead of printing out the whole list of our colors, you can go to this tab here at the bottom, find our color, oh sorry, the third one, all our colors. And instead of having names, you can see the actual colors. So if you hover over a, a color, you can see that this one is called Corn Silk 4, this one is called Dark Slate Blue, and this one is called Hot Pink 1. There are other ways to find colors. You can find particular R colors by specifying what kind of color you want. So if you want a light purple like this one, it'll tell you here's those R colors that you can use the names of. And finally, any color will give you the hex value for any color that you pick. So you can see this code here, hash and then six characters. This is a way to code, to specify a particular color and that's called a hex value. You can always use hex values. You don't have to use a um, R color, R color name. The R color names are only here for convenience. You can always use any hex value that you want. So if you wanted to replace this with better colors, you can replace this whole concatenated list of colors and use the color picker. So let's say You want to pick your custom colors, go to color picker with the cursor at the, sign, at the right spot. Make sure that you've got enough boxes here. So you can click the plus button to have five boxes and you can then pick the colors that you want. So I want first this kind of blue. For the second one, I want this kind of yellow. The third one, I want something that's a bit pink. The fourth one, some red. And finally, the fifth one will be orange. Right, sort of. 
You've got your five colors. You can click Done here, the blue button, and this will concatenate automatically a list of the six hex values. So you can see that this is more comfortable, more practical to create a list of six different values. So I can execute this and have a look at what it looks like. And there's my custom palette used in my visualization. I'll make some more space for our visualizations here and for uh, with some scale modifiers. So you can see that we used functions that starts, start with scale. We modified the color aesthetic here. What we're going to change here now is modify the y-axis to space out our data. So you can see that we've got a lot of data bunched up at the bottom and two countries that dominate the data set. So if you want to change or transform the data on the y-axis to spread out the data, you can use a built-in function that has one application is to apply a logarithm transformation to your data. So modify the y-scale to spread data. Again, we can start using by using our p base for our plot and use the function scale underscore y, it's the y aesthetic, underscore log 10. We don't need to specify any argument. The default behavior here is to transform the data along the y axis by a log 10 transformation. Execute that and you end up with spread out data like this. So this might make sense for your particular application, it might not. But make sure you justify any transformation, it needs to make sense. Another thing we can do is modify the axis breaks in our visualization. On the x-axis, at the bottom here, you can see that by default ggplot2 uses the decades decades for the years. So 1950, 1960, etc, etc. This makes sense because it makes a visualization uh, more or easier to read, uh, more visually pleasing often. But in our case, because we've got very specific years here where the data was collected, uh, we might want to change that so it actually applies to the actual data. So. Here, let's modify our x-axis breaks. The first step in that is to create a list of years included in our data set. And you can do that with the unique function. So I'm going to create an object called unique underscore years and use the assignment operator to store the output of the function unique on the data set gapminder, but specifically the column year or the variable year. So the unique function will find all the unique values in the year variable and store that as unique years. You can execute that. You can see in our environment that there is a vector, numerical vector with 12 years. Here it is. And it's called unique years. Now I can use that to create my ticks. Or breaks, rather. So we'll use the vector for the breaks on our x axis. Again, starting with the base of our plot, p, that we saved previously. We'll use again a scale function for the x aesthetic. And because we've got a continuous variable, we'll use the continuous variation here. The breaks argument will take the list provided by unique years. Execute that and you'll end up with a very similar visualization, but your frame at the back or your lines at the back and your ticks and labels on the x-axis correspond to the actual data. So you can see 1952 all the way to 2007. Another example of modifying the breaks. So I'll change this comment here because we're going to modify also the y-axis. I 
I'll add a plus after this scale x continuous function. And if I want, I can add another comment here. So I'll say simplify breaks on y axis. And to do that, we can use scale underscore y underscore continuous. You might have expected that. And here we're going to define a list of breaks. So we don't want the ones here. It's not really simplified, but making it more readable, rather. So here we want breaks, not with those automatic breaks that use the scientific notation. We want to use our custom list, and it's going to be 0, then followed by 100 million, 200 million, 500 million, and finally 1 billion. So this works straight away. You can have those different breaks with different distances between them. You can see it here on our y-axis, but it still uses this scientific notation. So what we can do is use an extra argument in our function scale y continuous and use labels, a list of labels. So I'm going to use again a concatenated list of labels that needs to be the exact same length of the breaks. Start with the 0, we're happy with this, but we'll follow with 100m string of characters, 200m, 500m, and finally 1b. So make sure that those th strings of characters are surrounded by those double quotes, or single quotes, and here you can see that our custom labels have been replaced, or have replaced our sci scientific notation here. So you can really customize as you want the breaks like this. Still working on axes or scales. I'll have a look at yet another modification. Imagine that you want to zoom in onto one particular part of your data. So if you want to ignore, for example, China and India at the top, but you want to zoom in at the bottom here on all the other countries, you can change the automatic limits of your y-axis. So let's modify the y scale range. Let's use the base of our plot and after a plus use the function ylim. So this is a shorter name for the limits of our y-axis and here we need to provide a concaten concatenated list or a vector of two values where the axis starts, 0, and where it stops, 360 million. So we end up with all the data except China and India, and notice that there is a warning message in our console here. It says, warning message removed 24 rows containing missing values for the geometry point. And that's really important information. That's 24 data points, which means 12 plus 12, two countries, China and India. So this is a good reminder that this particular plot that you just generated is not showing the whole data set. But at least here we can zoom in and have a look at other countries in more detail. So this is it for this particular example on modifying scales. We'll move on to a different geometry now and look at histograms, still using our same data set. We'll start with ggplot and save ourselves some typing by not mentioning the names of our arguments. So you can go straight to gapminder without using data equals. And for the aesthetic elements, you can go straight to the AES function without the mapping argument name and say that we want to associate the aesthetic x with the life exp variable. Make sure that you've got a capital E there. And after a plus, we'll change our geom function to geom histogram. No need to specify anything here. 
we'll have a look at what it looks like. So here's our histogram. The default of the histogram is to use 80, oh sorry, 30 bins. That's the number of cells in your plot. And it's categorized all our data along the range of life expectancy. And it's showing us that um, what's the range of the whole variable and also where are the biggest densities. So this is the default look of our histogram. If you want to change your number of bins, you can do that by using the bins argument, for example. That's what the message that's in our console. Stat bin is using bins equals 30. Pick better value with bin width. So two methods here. I can use bin width, as, you, as is recommended, bin width, and say that I want, for example, 15 years for each bin. So that's not particularly informative. I can reduce that to 10, see what it looks like. The other method is to use the bins argument and specify directly how many cells you want in your histogram. So I could say I want 40 cells rather than 30. So that's more definition. Again, I can go further up. 60 cells, and that's even more definition. But there's more noise there. So let's say we're going to stick to 10 bins for our next examples. Bins equals 10. And I'll add some information here, again bringing in the continent variable. So I'll add to AES, to the function AES, the aesthetic fill associated to continent. Now remember that we use fill here because we want to fill the whole area, whereas color would only color the outline of our areas. So now we can have a look at actually where continents are represented the most in the life expectancy range. You can see that, for example, Africa is more um, around the lower end of the range, whereas Europe is overrepresented and Oceania are overrepresented at the top of the range. Now what's interesting about the histogram geometry is that we can modify the position. So in our geom underscore histogram function, We can add an extra argument called position. And the default is stack. So this won't change anything, that's the default. You can check with looking at the help page for geom underscore histogram. So I can press the F1 button when I've got my cursor in the name of the function. Brings up the help page and I can scroll to my arguments and see the position argument here, which is the position adjustment either as a string or the result of a call to a position adjustment function. If you go to your function here, geom histogram, you can see that the default is stack. And that's all areas stacked on top of each other. Now I can change that doesn't have to be like this. Depending on what you want to represent, you can change it to, for example, fill. And this will fill the whole area. So the position fill uses ratios rather than absolute values. And here we've got on the count axis. Rather than an absolute value of the number of observations, we'll have a proportion or ratio or a fraction of this particular bin. So you can see that in the first bin here, we've got 50% that's associated to Asia and 50% that's associated to Africa. Whereas if you look at the last bin, the top bin is all in Asia. So that might be an interesting position to play around with. And a third position that you can try is dodge. 
and Dodge will create a separate bar for each category in the fill aesthetic and that will divide each one of your bin in several bars. So that might be a more comfortable way to compare how a continent is distributed between bins. So play around with those positions. They might be uh, very helpful to represent the data most effectively. All right, let's move on to faceting now. So faceting is useful to divide a plot in several facets, several plots, according to a variable. So we're going to use something very similar to our histogram before. Start with ggplot. Tell ggplot2 that the data comes from Gapminder, followed by the aesthetic function that groups our mappings of aesthetics. X is associated to lifexp still, and fill is associated to continent. After a plus, I'll go to geom underscore histogram and specify that my bins are 40. Finally, this is the difference here, we're going to use a function called facet underscore wrap. You can see that there's a couple of facet functions. You'll often use facet grid and facet wrap, but in our case we've got only one function or one sorry variable to divide our plot with, so we're going to use facet wrap to automatically wrap on several lines. So here we have to use the formula notation and that uses the tilde. So I'll start with a tilde and on the right side use the continent variable. Control enter and you can see what faceting does now. It divides our plot in several panels, several facets, one for each one of the variable that was used to create the faceting. So we've got a bit of information that's duplicated here, so let's do a little bit of theming, faceting and theming. Because we've got the continent variable that comes up for fill, for the colors, and the continent variable that comes up for the faceting. So what we're going to do is remove this legend on the right side because it doesn't really add to our visualization and make more space for the rest. So we can add an extra plus here and use the theme function with the argument legend.position as none. So no position means no legend. If you execute that, you end up with more space for your facets. So this is also where you would change the position of your legend to the bottom of your plot. For example, you can see it at the bottom here. You can also change it to, as you expect, the top, the top and the left. So you know that the legend position is by default to the right, but you can move it around or set it to none if you don't need it. So let's keep theming our plot. Remember in the first session that we use built-in themes? Let's have a look at theme underscore minimal here, which might make it a little bit leaner. So that removes the grey background and changes a few different things. That might be the look that you're after. Remember that there's quite a few functions. If you start typing theme underscore something, you'll see black and white, classic, dark, etc, etc. If you want to play around with more functions like this, you can use an extra package to explore different ones. And it's called GG Themes. So I'll go back to the console here, use install.packages with the string GG Themes and execute that. So 
So you can use GG themes for more options. I've installed it, I can load it now with library GG themes. And now if I start typing theme underscore, I can see that not only there's my ggplot function, oh, R code execution error. I've got an issue here, not sure what it is. Hopefully, ah yeah, it's having a struggle there. Which might have to do with the latest versions of the packages. So for example, if I want to use gg theme, um, themes function theme underscore calc, let's see what this does. So it still works. And that's using the style from um, Calc. You can use also other websites or uh, use a terrible, terrible theme from Excel, from an old version of Excel. So there's a few funny ones there, but um, there's more interesting ones too. So I can go to the help and have a look at GG themes, see if I find some help there. Okay, so there's a problem with the help page. I think that's the only issue here. So we won't be able to have a look at that. You might find some information on your own. But the functions still work here. So try them out. Uh, I'm going to stick to minimal here because I think it's nice and clean. And uh, keep going with the theming here. Now notice that something happened here. Now I've got my legend that is back. That's because I've used my theme modifier here first and then I've used the theme underscore minimal function. And what theme underscore minimal does is that it will replace a bunch of the defaults and it has apparently replaced my setting for legend position. So what we can do here is invert the two. So I'll cut this and put it after my minimal theme. And this should work. There you go. We've got our minimal theme and we've got our legend that is gone. One more thing you can do with your plot is add labels. So I'm going to go xlab, which is the short version for adding a label to the x-axis. I'm going to say life expectancy here, a bit more understandable than the current label. And after that, a Y lab. Similarly, to have maybe capitals here. Okay, now I've got my capitals and my different name for the X axis. So let's have a look at an example of customizing a scatter plot. I'm going to use mostly the tools that we've just had a look at during the session. So I'm going to start with ggplot. Capminder is our data set. AES will take the x-axis associated to GDP per cap. That's GDP per capita. We want to have a look at the relationship between GDP per capita and life, exp, life expectancy. So on the y-axis, life exp on the x-axis GDP per cap. And the geometry that I'll use is geom point. Now I'm straight away going to use some labels. I'm going to label it on the x-axis GDP per capita. On the y-axis life expectancy. And the title is How does GDP relate to life expectancy? If 
finally I'm going to use the theme underscore black and white. So this is all functions that you've seen before. It's not an ideal plot here. It's very dry and we can probably present it a bit better. So notice that here I didn't use xlab and ylab. I used the full labs function to specify labels for x, y, title. This is where you can also give your plots tags if there's several ones, a caption, etc, etc. So what I'm going to modify this with is add an extra aesthetic to color according to continents, very similar to what we did before. But here we're going to do it locally in the point geometry and say color is associated to continent. Let's have a look at what this does. Okay, we've got our legend and we've got our colors on our points. Now the reason why I'm coloring here locally is because I'm going to use an extra geometry. The extra ge geometry is geom underscore smooth and it's a smooth line that's going to go on top of my plot. So this is a bit messy. By default it uses the gam function here because I've got quite a few points. You can see it in the console. It's a little bit of information about the automatic method that has picked a function that's most suited to the data set according to ggplot2. Uh, what I'm going to do here to make it better is go to a scale modifier after a plus and I'm going to modify the x-axis to do a log 10 transformation to spread out the data. Okay. And the other thing that I want to do is modify the default smoothing method with a linear model. So in between double quotes here I can specify lm to use as a function for my smoothing method and here it goes through the data with a straight line. Finally, I want to maybe make the plot a little bit more readable by adding some transparency to my point geometry. So I can go to my point geometry and add a second argument here and say alpha, which is accessible in a lot of functions, to give some transparency. And I'm going to give 0 0.5 percent or 0 0.5 uh, as a fraction of transparency or opacity. Here we go, and there's an, our enhanced plot. Hopefully it makes a bit more sense now. Now the transformations that we use and the particular uh, smooth line on top or trend line, you have to justify why you're using that. And um, you might find it makes sense or it doesn't depending on the data that you're playing with and what your question is. Now, just to make sure that... Um, yeah, so for GM point, we use the local setting of mapping the color aesthetic to the continent variable because we don't we didn't want to spe specify in the ggplot call otherwise it would have been into taken into account by GM smooth and it would have drawn a different line for each one of our continents. That's why we only had to color inside the GM point function. So to save our plots, if we like this one in particular, we can use a particular command. We've used before the menu here, export, you can find here. You can save as an image, you can save as a PDF, you can copy to your clipboard, but if you want to automate the process, you can use a function called ggsave. They will automatically save the last generated plot. For example, myplot.png. Well, let's give it a more descriptive name, maybe GDP. Lifexp. But I'm going to make sure I save it underneath or inside my plots directory. So I can specify here the path to where I want to save it and also, also 
the name of the file. So you can do that. It tells you what size it has saved your image as. And if you navigate to your files tab here, you can see your plots directory and your file is here. So if you click on that, it will automatically open it with whatever um, program you use usually to open pictures. So it saved it as a PNG, that's what we said. Gave it the right name and it saved it inside the plots directory. Now if you want to see some help about ggsave, you can bring up with F1 the help page and you can see that there's more arguments that are available. In particular what's interesting here is that you can specify the DPIs. So in DPI you can specify the plot resolution which is important depending on where you want to present your visualization. So it not only accepts numbers for dots per inches, but it can also take a, a name like a word like retina or print or screen, depending on where you want to present the visualization. So that's a particularly handy one, especially if you want to put something on a poster and you want to make sure it's got no visible pixels. You can also specify directly the width and the height of your plot making sure uh, you specify your unit too. So for example, I could say width is 20 centimeters, the height is 15 centimeters, and the units are cm. So it doesn't give me any feedback here because I've specified the size, but if I go to my files and open this, now it's got the size that I've given it. 15 centimeters up, 20 centimeters wide, and I can also change the DPIs if I want to. Right. Now there's quite a few more geometries available. One example is the bar geometry. So let's have a look at this one again with Gapminder and the aesthetic x equal continent. A simple example there, just having a look at how many times a continent comes up in the data set. You have to specify geom underscore something, and you can see that there's quite a few available, including some GG themes ones, I think. Yeah, there's one here, for example, range frame up there. I'm not going to have a look at the help pages. Oops, there we go. That's my error. <laughs> but here I'm going to use bar. And by default, the bar geometry will use the count statistic, which will count the number of times something comes up in a data set. So we can see that Africa comes up more than 600 times, whereas Oceania just a few times. So that's our bar geometry, very similar to histogram in a way. Another one that might be very useful for you is the box plot geometry. So again, ggplot is our default call using the Gapminder data set and in the aesthetics we'll have to use two here. X is continent and Y is life exp. Let's have a look at the spread of the data for each continent using the geom box plot function. Here's our box plots. So you can see your box and boxes and whiskers and your outliers outside. Very similar to box plot is the violin plot. So it might be a bit more helpful to visualize densities more precisely. So using the exact same code here, Gapminder is the data, the aesthetics are x associated to continent, y associated to life exp. But instead of box plot, we're going to use gm underscore violin. And you'll see that it's very similar, but it allows you to visualize some variation in density here, for example, in this particular one. 
rather than just a square box. If you find that your axes at the bottom are overlapping, it might happen with some, some categories, some very long labels. You can play around with theming again. And in this case, I would use axis.text.x because we want on the x-axis the text of the axis. Sorry, the, the text of the labels on the x-axis. And we'll have to use a function called element underscore text, which you use to modify any text element in ggplot2. And we'll specify that the angle needs to be 90. So this turns the text around and now you can maybe have more space and you won't have any overlap. And this is it for today. The one little extra that I wanted to show you is to use an add-in called Eskis to cheat. So you can do that with install.packages Eskis and it's another example of a add-in that's added to your RStudio interface. So install.packages and the string Eskis gives you a graphical user interface for doing ggplot2 visualizations. So if you're feeling a little bit lazy and you want to use something graphical rather than figuring out the code, you can go to your add-ins menu and under the header S keys here, you can see ggplot2 builder. So click on that and it will open this new window where you can select a data frame. So here we've got a gap-minded data set. And we can select the variables that we want to keep. By default, it keeps them all. And we can click Validate Imported Data. So you end up with this window here that allows you to drag and drop variables into those boxes, those aesthetics boxes, and try and see what it comes up automatically as for a visualization. So for example, let's do GDP per capita is on Y, and we'll have a look at continent on X. So it ends up with a box plot here. That's the default that it's selected. But if you want, we can change that and select a different visualization. So I could change it to violin here. And you can play around with that. For example, can also reuse, I think, continent into the fill. Now you've got different colors for your visualization or for each one of your violins. But the good thing is that it's not all graphical. It's, you can click on export and code here and you can modify the code or you can, I believe, or you can at least copy it to clipboard or instead insert the code in the script. So if I click on here, and go back to my script. I've got the code here that went to my console. I didn't have my active cursor in the script, but you've got the code here that was just generated by Eskis. I can go back to my builder here. Again, use Gapminder and try other options. Now notice that You can also change other options here with the menus at the bottom. So you can change your legend position here, for example. So if I put continent in color, I can straight away change my legend position here. I can also select one of the palettes that are automatically included. And that's very similar to what we did with Color Brewer. So here I can change it to a different qualitative one. Set one, change labels here, and then also filter the data. So if I want to reduce, for example, the years, I only want to have a look at the years until 1987, I can do that here, and it reduces the range of my data. Again, you can see the code here. 
So here you go, this is it for today. If you look at the material that's online, that stays public and up to date, um, you'll find that there's another example at the bottom that we haven't been, uh, that we haven't had a look at, but it's yet another thing that you can explore, have a look at the code, try and figure out what it does. Um, and this is the resulting visualization with a different data set called diamonds. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go there. But also make sure that you follow our, our, our links for uh, ggplot2 in particular here. But there's also a compilation of more R resources that we compiled over the last few months and that we recommend you to have a look at. So hopefully this session was helpful to you. Um, make sure you save your script. Control S. It will be all saved inside your working directory. There's your script. And you will be able to open your project again from the project menu if you want to. Thanks for watching uh, and hopefully find you at another session. Cheers.